This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. I, I serve as the director of the Hayden Planetarium right here in New York City at the American Museum of Natural History. And today's episode, we're going to talk about the science in the Space Force. <laughs> Space of course, Force! <laughs> of course, I got my co-host Chuck Nice. Chuck. Hey, just a reminder to everybody, I serve as the director of my town home here in Jersey. <laughs> okay, there, there you go. There you go. And one of our old-time favorites here on Star Talk to help us navigate the Space Force, we've got my friend and colleague and geek-in-chief, Charles Liu. <laughs> Charles. Hi, so good to see you. And I'll just uh, tell you that I'm the director of absolutely nothing. Okay. <laughs> that means you're getting work done, you see? <laughs> I hope. Yeah. You can be productive or you can be creative, but you can't be both. So mm. I don't know. So uh, what we're going to talk about is the Space Force. Oh, allow me to remind everyone that Charles is a professor at the City University of New York on Staten Island, and he's an associate in our Department of Astrophysics at the American Museum of Natural History. So I get my dose of Charles whenever I want. <laughs> <laughs> and I get a dose of you whenever I want, Neil. It works so, out great. We're talking about the Space Force, and later in this program, we're going to bring on Major General Deanna Burke. She's a general in the U.S. Space Force. Yes, this is real. Excellent. And in our, in our third segment, we're going to talk about space junk with the general, and we're going to bring in an aerospace engineer who specializes in space junk, yes. Maury, ba Maury Baja, who's a friend of Star Talk, he's been on before. So let's get let's get started here. So so uh, I don't know how many people, you know, read my six hundred thousand page book. <laughs> <laughs> Which one, Neil? Which one? Which, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was called "Accessory to War: mm. The Unspoken Alliance Between Astrophysics and the Military." It's all in there. It's what what role. Uh, being an expert on the universe, has to, what that has to do with any kind of uh, military operation, military hegemony, uh, on, on, on do domination, whatever people were doing in the history of civilization, there was an astronomer right there because the sky enabled people to navigate. Mm. And Charles, what is the greatest navigation system ever devised? What? You mean... The sky and well, no. navigation. <laughs> you mean GPS? GPS, oh, thank you. Oh, that's yes. the one you're looking for. Okay. G GPS. Yes. Satellite that's how you based. Can, you can find gram, you know, the directions to grandma's house. So uh, all this is, uh, is pivots on navigation. And there's always some kind of astronomer, astrophysicist in the mix. And so uh, if anyone is interested in sort of the, the deep history of that, relationship, it's all in the book. Or you can just listen to this show and not buy the book, okay? <laughs> you can well, do either. Let, let me just tell you, got a little note from your uh, publisher here. Neil, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Keep pushing the book, Neil. Keep yeah, pushing absolutely. the book. No. <laughs> now, you're the only guy I know who, who actually promotes his book by going, hey, you know, you don't have to get it. No, because I can't. I'm not making people spend yeah. any money you know, you can, you can listen to this show and ah, just don't get the book. Okay. Just don't get the book. Yeah. No, no, get the book, people. Uh, so we had a, a, a Star Talk on National Geographic episode where we sort of introduced the concept of a space force before it was formally designated okay. as such. Yep. And we showed some footage of me visiting the Thule Air Force Base yeah. in Greenland. Greenland. Oh, wow. my gosh. Which is not green at all. It's not green. It's cold. It's cold. That's all I'm talking about. <laughs> what I liked about that episode was uh, Neil got off the plane in the beginning of the episode. He had on, like, a jacket. It was kind of open. I was cool. Yeah, yeah. Little, I was kind of cool. Hello, <laughs> scarf on. Just, hey, what's happening, Greenland? What's going on? I got on? this. I got by, this. <laughs> by the end of the episode, Neil, you couldn't see his face. <laughs> he, had on, he had on four parkas. He had on four parkas. <laughs> and, and, and Chuck, I don't think you could resist this statement why there are no black people in uh, uh, <laughs> let me tell you something there was not one brother not one brother in greenland and they had and neil showed up and they and, and they were like oh wow what are you doing here <laughs> well at that tool air force base in the top of the world they monitor satellites and missile threats and anything from space that could be coming over the pole and now that is under the auspices of the space force and we're going to find out more 
about how that works from uh, General Burt uh, later in the show. But right now, Charles, I want to get some physics out of the way before okay. we break into that second segment. Um, you know, we, we can think of ways you might destroy a satellite if there's any kind of military conflict on orbit. Mm -hmm. And uh, something that shows up in a lot of sci-fi stories, um, even movies that are not sci-fi, just fi, okay, <laughs> is the EMP. Ah, yes. the, the electromagnetic pulse. The electromagnetic pulse. Now, that's that made a cameo in uh, Ocean's Eleven. You might remember that, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. it's, it was an EMP that took out the power grid in Las Vegas when they... Um, when they robbed the the safe. Also, there was an EMP in The Matrix. The Matrix. Yes. Of course. Okay. The Nebuchadnezzar. The Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> and all the, the, the sentinels were coming at him. And they, yes. they can't attack him one by one, but an EMP can take them all out. It was exactly what they showed. Yep. So, Charles. Yes. My, my fellow physicist. Yes. Tell me about EMPs. What are they? And why why do they destroy machines and not people? No, it's very simple. Electromagnetic pulse is a burst of radiation. Uh, it could also contain electrons, but mostly uh, it's high energy radiation that will disrupt electronics. Think about it. If you're ever listening to radio and a lightning strike, a lightning bolt hits nearby, for a moment your radio goes tss, brief bit of static. The bottom line is, and we'll keep this super short, the electromagnetic pulse an electromagnetic pulse can simply be created by detonating a very large nuclear device, maybe a few tens or maybe a few hundred miles up from the Earth's surface. And if it's a powerful enough burst, it will blast so much pulse out into the environment that it will fry any electronic devices, communication systems, or power grids in its vicinity. So you wind up. So you're not talking about the blast, the physical blast. You're talking about the electromagnetic blast that's associated with those bombs as well. That's right. The, the, okay. the physical blast is bad enough, but there were yeah. some nightmare scenarios back in the 80s where maybe an enemy could take a huge bomb, put it a couple hundred miles up above the continental United States, detonate it, create an electromagnetic pulse from coast to coast, and wipe out all communications and command and control of the United States before a single shot was fired. Mm. Wow. Wow. Electromagnetic pulse. Ooh. So can we protect against electromagnetic pulses? Yes, to some extent. Uh, the military knows how to harden things to mm. protect it from electromagnetic pulse. For example, Air Force One. was hardened in quotes. I like the way you said that. You uttered that, Charles. That's right. That was, a, that was a Charles. This word is in quotes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Air Force One, for example, is hardened uh, against EMP. But unfortunately, you can only do so much. Uh, before you will be overwhelmed if the blast is too close or too powerful. So is this the famous Faraday cage you can stick it in? You can help. That will help, yes, when you mm -hmm. surround something uh, with metal. But and also, don't forget uh, tinfoil hats. <laughs> <laughs> tinfoil That's hats a different very, kind of pulse. <laughs> yeah, That's various. a different kind of pulse. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> very effective. <laughs> well, wait, so if you surround something with a, a metallic frame, then the electromagnetic energy gets stopped at that outer surface. Right. It circles it around the outside. The, something called the skin effect. That's right. The skin effect. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So if you want uh, uh, satellites to survive an enemy attack, not by missiles, but by an EMP, you'd want to harden them in this way. Yes. For example, there are other ways. So, to so in the all the examples of this that you have seen, in film, have they done it right? Like, how about in Ocean's Eleven? No. I mean, that wasn't wasn't a bomb. It was just something that made the pure electromagnetic pulse. And apparently, yeah. this high energy radiation is not melting the flesh off of the people who detonate the switch. Unfortunately. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're a morbid dude. Have you have you have you gotten this checked out? Uh, no, I, you know I haven't. <laughs> it's still, it's still it's, rampant it's within still, you. <laughs> it's just happening, man. I can't help it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so how is it that you can have a pulse that doesn't then harm the people who engage the pulse? A pulse is electromagnetic and therefore generally passes through the human body. If it's strong enough, it can scramble you, cause you, you know, injury the way like a radiation burn might. But hmm. generally speaking, it takes much less to damage an electronic system than it does to damage uh, us. Okay. All right. All right. I, 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 I can get that. 
Plus, I presume if you design an EMP detonator, you could tune the frequencies to be just what would be most damaging to a circuit and not to whatever might be the electrochemistry of the human body. It's possible, but it's a little harder to do that, though. Uh, when you have a bomb going off, especially a nuke, uh, a lot of radiation goes out from a lot of ranges. That's just the way it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh. Yeah, and you just take it. And so, yeah, human beings are under threat, but a human being at a certain distance will wind up being damaged less than an electronic device at that same distance. That's or even at a greater case. distance, right, right. That's right, general. Right. Okay, all right. All right, cool. Well, we got to take a quick break. And when we come back, Charles, you can stay with us. And we're going to bring you. on uh, Major General Deanna Burt, who's who's in the Space Force. This wow. is an actual... Na, 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 and, and, na, and, we're the Space Force. We're the wait, wait, force you, that a song? deals with space. Well, um, the Air Force has designated a, a march, uh, which is based on a piece by John Philip Sousa called The Invincible Eagle. However, no lyrics have yet been written. Oh, oh! Okay, so this is the, waiting for for the moment. We're waiting gotcha. for Charles to utter the <laughs> lyrics. <laughs> da, 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 da. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's much better than mine, which was just space force, nothing but space force. <laughs> yes, we are space oh. force, 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 space force. force. <laughs> <laughs> Where have I heard that before? I don't. All right, guys, we take a break. Okay. We're going to come back with an actual member of the actual U.S. Space Force on Star Talk. We're back, Star Talk. We're talking about the Space Force. <laughs> Space Force. And I got my co host, Chuck. Nice, Chuck. Hey, hey, hey. Chuck, you're go still going to Chuck Nice Comic. Um, Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, I um, am. You are indeed. I, and, I, I, and our resident geek in chief for a return visit, his nth return visit, we say mathematically because <laughs> yeah, exactly. we've lost count. Lost count. Charles Lou. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, Charles Liu, always good to have you back here, Pleasure. Charles. Thanks so yeah, much for having me. We're talking about the Space Force, and for yeah. this segment, we are bringing in an actual physical human being person who's part of the Space Force, Major yeah. General <laughs> Major General Deanna Burt. Deanna, welcome, welcome, General, welcome to Star Talk. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Tyson. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys today. Excellent. And I've got your uh, whole... Now, now that we're just using uh, our actual titles, please, I am Lord Nice. Okay, Lord Nice. Okay. <laughs> Your lordship. Yeah, yes. we we got Dr. Lou, Dr. Tyson, Major General Burt, and Lord Nice. Okay, Lord, Lord Nice. Uh, so, just some of your your pedigree. I mean, you guys have these titles which are very precise in the military world, but they just sound so impressive just listening it from the from the outside. So, as I as I have it written here, you're commander of the Combined Force Space Component Command wow. of the U.S. Space Command. Did I get that right? Yes, sir, you did. Cool, cool. And you're also Vice Commander of Space Operations Command at Vandenberg, uh, Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. Wow. Yes, sir. That's different from the Commander of Vice. That's different from being Vice Commander. I <laughs> that, was, that was my former position. <laughs> that was, that's, that's what, what I used to do. <laughs> different <laughs> operations there. Yeah. Uh, and, you, and you were formally at Peterson... Uh, uh, Space Force, I knew it as Peterson Air Force Base, now Peterson Space Force Base, Colorado. I visited that uh, when I served on the board of the Space Foundation. And uh, correct me, um, General, is that where they control uh, GPS satellites? Is that still Yes, the sir, case? out at Schriever Space Force Base. That's about 12 miles uh, east of Peterson. Okay, both wow. in Colorado, for sure. Yes, sir. There it is. So so tell us, what is what is your actual role as a major general in the new U.S. Space Force? So thanks, Dr. Tyson. I think, again, we talked about that I have two hats. So my first hat that you mentioned, I'm a functional component command working directly for General Dickinson, the U.S. Space Command commander. So uh, I command and control about 17,000 uh, military and civilian personnel wow. to provide combat space effects to the other combatant commands, the multi-domain fight, uh, and our coalition partners uh, and the nation. Just to be clear, multi-domain means other branches of the armed forces. Is that correct? Absolutely. So yeah, okay. uh, again, space is not just done for space's sake. It's done to be able to provide those war winning effects, uh, both to the nation and to the other services so they can fight and win uh, the fights that they come against. Uh, on the service side, though, my other hat that you mentioned, and I'm a vice commander, uh, I also work on the generate, sustain, uh, and present for the Air Space Force and how do we put forces together. So I'm really, it's good that I have the two hats. And one way I'm looking at how do we make sure the forces are ready 
uh, to be presented to as the vice commander to then present to the combatant command in my joint hat uh, to do that warfighting mission. Wow. So you have uh, you have a degree in aerospace engineering. So what we were, were you thinking back then? Gee, I want to be general in the U.S. Space Force yeah. that isn't invented yet. Like what's what's going through your head? Not even close. Uh, okay. I <laughs> I am a first generation uh, college student in my family, and ooh, so uh, that was a big wow. deal. Well, uh, now, I mean, now, yeah, it, you know, you, you could have done just a little less. Yeah, major, what a, what a you know, major general. Like, seriously. You know, you're, the, first, you're the first to do it, and you're, you're just like, I'm just going to blow up the road behind me for everybody else. Like, you're just going to be completely embarrassed if you try to follow in these footsteps. Yeah, I'm Damn. the first generation. I'm now a major general. I'm head of all space. And, uh, yeah, you know. And I got 17,000 people and reporting to me. <laughs> So your lordship, I want you to imagine you're my brother who's three years younger than me. Yeah, it doesn't go really well. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Damn, man. Okay, so what was what was your brain transition from uh, getting a, quote, simple engineering degree to, to landing uh, as an officer in the military? So I, I think I entered Dr. Tyson the same way many people come into the military. It's for college. I mean, my parents couldn't afford to send me to college. Uh, the Air Force offered me a, a four-year degree if I was willing to pursue pursue STEM, science, technology, engineering, or math. Uh, I took aeronautical engineering at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. It was far enough away from home that I didn't see my parents every weekend, but I could go home to Jacksonville, Florida, where my family was uh, when I wanted to. Um, I was a Space Coast baby, so space was always interesting to me growing up with the shuttle program and all those. Space Coast is the east coast of Florida, in the northern section where where we have Cape Canaveral. Right. So uh, I don't know how many people know that that's just called Space Coast, but it certainly is. And, and, and glad to hear that you had a little bit of space baptism from that exposure. Okay, go keep going. I'm but, but I but I thought you know I was going to do my four and done because uh, when you take a scholarship, you owe four years back uh, to the military. Uh, but I fell in love with the people and the mission, uh, and here I am, 29 years later. So uh, it's been really good to me, and I've learned a ton. And now I've crossed over three months ago from the Air Force to the Space Force. Uh, and it's just been uh, amazing, amazing ride. So, so here, I, I just want to ask very quickly, because it's a, just a bit of an aside, just a bit of a digression. Who came up with the name Space Force? Because I'm just going to say it's it's so very clever. No, I think the, the name United States Space Force identifies the domain that we work in, and it's a yeah. warfighting domain, and then the force that executes, just like you have the United States Air Force, the United States Army. Uh, again, they typically associate with the domain that they operate in. Okay, now, so we, we've got to get to brass tacks here because there's some percent of the public. I don't think it's the majority, but it's enough of them for me to bring the question to you. Uh, they're concerned that Space Force is sort of the escalation of military tensions in the world and that it's it's just, we're just going to have uh, laser fights and, and, and bombs in space. And I don't think people see this as a positive step as opposed to being either neutral or a peaceful step for the future of the security of the world. Could you just react to that? No, oh, I, I, I totally understand. And, and understand as a military member, I don't want to see a war that extends into space. That's not good for anyone. That's not good for our coalition partners, commercial industry, anybody. So uh, we don't want to see that. But like any other uh, department, we have to be ready to fight and win our nation's wars wherever they go. Uh, so again, our enemies are showing and the threats have evolved. Uh, General Raymond and General Dickinson have both testified to many things that are on orbit today uh, by our strategic adversaries or competitors, uh, China and Russia, that exist as we speak right now. So uh, it's not that the threats are coming. The threats are on orbit, and we have to be prepared to uh, respond uh, and react and protect our assets. And when for those say, who, who are into our archives, uh, we actually have General Raymond as a guest on an yeah, earlier yeah. episode of Star Talk. So you can dig that out of our files. Uh, Chuck, you, what were you saying? When you say threat... What exactly are you referring to uh, as a threat when it comes okay. to uh, our low Earth orbit uh, positions? Or any, so, any Earth orbit. Or yeah. any Earth orbit, <laughs> so, exactly. So, so you have direct ascent uh, anti-satellite munitions, so uh, ASATs uh, for both low Earth orbit and beyond, and that's been proven by the Chinese in 2007. They launched an ASAT and killed one of their own, hit one of their own dead uh, weather birds in oh. 2007, blew it into thousands of pieces. We are still tracking to this day. Uh, and will be for generations to come. Uh, so that created un long lived debris that will affect everyone in the domain, not just the Department of Defense. Uh, and, and it'll affect China as well. 
Yeah. Right? Yes. That's, that's like peeing in your own in your own yeah. bathtub. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I mean, what what were they doing? Is that like a guy who starts a fight by punching himself in the face? <laughs> you know, just like I'll show you how tough I am. <laughs> like, what the heck? Well, what we'll do is we got more Baja coming in in the third segment, and that's his total expertise. So, okay. So let's. Uh, that's a nice seed planted for that. So let let's keep going on. What what other uh, threats do we see? So the other options that are out there, again, General Raymond and General Dickinson in their congressional testimonies talked about both of these. One is a Chinese robotic arm. Uh, So they have a robotic arm in uh, geosynchronous orbit that they are doing testing with. So if you've seen the show Space Force, one of my favorites, uh, in the second episode, you see the the satellite. Let's be clear, that's a comedy, right? Yes, sir, it is. With Steve Carell. Okay, good. (laughs) And when you see them cut the solar panel off of the satellite, uh, funny ha-ha, but when you talk about Today, on orbit, the Chinese have a robotic arm. That's exactly what they could do. They could rip off a piece of a satellite or hurt it in some way, uh, throw it into an unusable orbit. So again, that robotic arm uh, is very scary and a very uh, high interest orbit for communications, missile warning, uh, and all the capabilities that we depend on to protect and communicate with our forces. Uh, The second one, uh, again, is what we call the Russian nesting doll. So the Russians launched into low earth orbit, uh, a Russian nesting primary vehicle, launched uh, an orbital engagement system that came out of that satellite. And then from that satellite uh, came a kinetic kill vehicle. Uh, It shadowed one of our high value assets in low earth orbit uh, for a period of time that again, to us uh, was not appropriate because they were testing that capability. And instead of testing against their own capabilities, they were shadowing and testing near one of our high value assets. Uh, So again, not, not good happening every day and on orbit and they're capabilities continue to grow. And again, those are all down class level. We've uh, recognized that security is important uh, for us, but at the same time, how do we portray to the American people? What are the threats on orbit? It's really hard uh, to understand because satellites don't have moms, right? No one can understand what the threats are on orbit because you don't see them every day as you do in the other domains and you get pictures up. So it's really hard to communicate uh, to the American people what this is. And the show is really important to doing that. And so I appreciate that you do these because it, it makes it real to folks. It helps them understand uh, some very complex things as the boss says, space is hard. How, how do you translate that to the American people? And the so the t- uh, uh, interesting, very uh, uh, perceptive point that satellites don't have family that you can then get them to plea for their safety. But satellites do have financial value, not only in the value of the hardware itself, but in the marketplace that it enables, be it Uber or Tinder or bank records or anything else, uh, is there some clear way? And is it your job to communicate how deep that threat can be to our way of life? Or, or well, is there some other agency that whose job that is and not yours? No, I, that's absolutely ours. I mean, we it, there is a threat to the American way of life and the American way of war if we lose these capabilities. I mean, GPS, I'm a former GPS squadron commander. I mean, one of the things we talk about with all the time with GPS is not only the navigation signal, which we all use every day to travel the world, but also the timing signal. The timing signal is used to stick many of our uh, cell towers and communication networks that you use every day, as well as the New York Stock Exchange. So imagine if that timing signal is gone. What does that do to trade? What does that do to commerce? Uh, I mean, those are uh, things that happen every day. General, one of General Dickinson as the U.S. Space Command uh, commander's slogans is never a day without space. So again, absolutely his wheelhouse is Space Command commander to defend and protect uh, all those capabilities. And most people don't even know. I mean, I try, I really, I try, <laughs> but they don't know how much of your everyday life is touched by space assets. Even beyond simple GPS. I mean, they, I don't think people appreciate that. And so I think there, there, there's a task ahead of us all in this to try to communicate um, the value of what you are doing. And do these satellites that you guys are uh, responsible for, uh, for lack of a better term, do they include uh, private sector uh, property? That oh, that's a good, good question, yeah. No, or just government lordship, satellites. Your lordship, <clears throat> great question. So, <laughs> <laughs> She's sticking with that title. 
You know what? <laughs> See, but this is the difference between <laughs> civilians and people in the military. People in the military are like, oh, you want to be that? I'm going to make you regret that. <laughs> no, no. No, no, Chuck, I, you, Chuck I, you're going to have to change your Twitter handle. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> the Lord no, Lordship. I, I think Lordship Nice has a great ring to it. It does. I, I would it does. Use that. It, it actually, I hate to admit yeah. it, but it does. It does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, no, anyway, what, yeah that's ahead. a great question. So what I would say is um, we track 32,000 pieces on orbit. Of that 32,000, about 5,000 are active satellites or active objects. Uh, and from that, then about 10 percentish of those are government resources for the United States of America, whether that be Department of Defense uh, or other agencies, but government capability. When you guys did this interview with General uh, Raymond in 2019, we had about 1,800 objects that were live on orbit, and that was quoted in that podcast. Today, think 5,000. We've almost tripled. Whoa. And you might say, well, why did we triple? That's not government because I'm only 10 percent. We're only 10 percent of that. The the triple has happened in the commercial market. The cost of launch has reduced based on the number of folks who are bringing that capability to bear and, and reducing launch costs. And now you see companies engaging in building satellites, uh, SpaceX with Starlink, uh, getting ready to launch 100 at a throw to get 5G in low orbit. Uh, OneWeb. I mean, there are many companies now that are launching satellites uh, and we only see that continuing to explode. So to and, your and by point, the way, Char Charles and I have are co-authors on papers that use data from the Hubble Space Telescope, which is a honkering satellite up there. Yeah. We, you know, not enough people think of it as a satellite. It's a satellite, but it's yeah. a big one, the size of a Greyhound bus. You know, I'd like to think that some major portion of your responsibility is protecting that telescope. I'm just saying, between you and me. Absolutely, and we do that day in and day out to ensure nothing uh, from a debris perspective or another active payload would conjunct or hit you. Uh, also, mm -hmm. as any of those uh, objects re-enter Earth's atmosphere, we're tracking those and reporting mm -hmm. those, working with right. State Department if we predict a landing in another country uh, or how that would uh, happen in through U.S. Space Command. So that those are happening day in and day out, and that's our bread and butter of our job. I think what will change here shortly, which we really need to normalize the domain, and this is all space traffic management, right? How do we operate uh, on orbit, satellite to satellite, and is free and fair for all, is the Department of Commerce. So the, there's an NDAA, a National Defense Authorization Act, that says the Department of Commerce will be the lead for space traffic management. We have been doing that as the government because the government had the lion's share of, of capability on orbit due to the cost of entry. But as I said earlier, you can see now it's tripled. It's Listen, more the old days. Yeah, the yeah. old days. Yeah, yeah. So, we need an FAA for space. I'm, I'm reminded that NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, is a branch of the Department of Commerce. And so here we are monitoring climate and weather, recognizing its direct impact on the economic security of the nation. So, so, so Charles, have, do you have a question? Have uh, a question yes, it would, it would be great. Thank you. I have two very short questions, if that's okay. Uh, first of all, um, you mentioned domain. Right. As we know, the United States generally considers space as being 50 miles on up. So I presume that your domain certainly starts at 50 miles perhaps before then. But how far up does it go? Does it go past the moon? Does it go to the moon or lunar orbit? Does it go to Mars? In other words, is space force really the force for the domain of the universe itself or just a little bit less than that? No, and yeah, General, great... he, he, he wants you to protect from here to the edge of the, the cosmic horizon. Right. That's well, what that sounds so, like. So what I would say is, uh, as the U.S. Space Command uh, unified command plan, so when you're a combatant commander, you have a unified command plan that defines what your area of responsibility is. Uh, every geographic combatant commander has that. So whether you're European Command, Pacific Command, you have a defined area of responsibility. For General Dickinson, as the U.S. Space Command commander, the unified command plan signed by the SECDEF and the president states that he is responsible for 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface mm. to infinity. Ooh, to infinity. Wow. Ooh, and beyond. Wow. And beyond. <laughs> and beyond. <laughs> that, that, no, that completely no. wait, wait, answers General, my question. General, go back to that document and you have to put in and beyond. You have yeah. to go, yeah, please do that. <laughs> and by the now. way, yeah, you have to stretch it out in type, you know. <laughs> and beyond. <laughs> and, and, and in all seriousness, uh, to Dr. Lou's question is, 
I would say to you day to day, Dr. Lou, we are concerned mostly with geo and in. So 22,500 okay. miles and in to that 100 kilometer area is where we focus day to day. Geo uh, is, is, is code for geo Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, when you Thank talk you. about the moon and you talk about where we're going in 2024 by putting astronauts on the moon to stay, where Elon Musk is in his uh, adventure to get to Mars, uh, you can see, though, that in the next five to 10 years, uh, it will become geo and out. Mm. and how far out is appropriate. Uh, one yeah. of the discussions we've had is about geo times 14. And you might say, hey, Deanna, Dr. Lou may know this answer, but <laughs> geo times 14 is where you have a three-body problem between yes. the earth, the moon, and the sun. Right. And so we're trying to define requirements in the military of, of how far out do we want to start looking for the future to right. then build requirements and build systems and and do budget requests, et cetera, for all of that. So, That's right. Uh, Really, it's geo That sounds like the Lagrangian point, point I guess. Right. You Charles. have to start, yes, you have to start paying very ten close attention to Lagrange surfaces and, and Lise Joux figures and things like that. Right, but, right. Okay, but, now I'm, but, I, but, wait a minute. No, no, I've no, heard no, no, of no. Lagrange. What is, you can't just drop in <laughs> you say, you, like, like you're on a French <laughs> cooking show. And you just just you and Lagrange. Lagrange. Look it up, look it up. No, yeah. no, yes, I, I have, have a, no, no, I, I really, I, I would love to ask one more question. And this is actually from my educator's hat, if that's okay, General Burke. You bet. First, let me just thank you on behalf of so many of us uh, for your service to the country, to keeping us safe, to making sure that our lives are, are as good as they are. So thank you so much for that. Now, there are people, young men and women and uh, young people all over who are looking at you and saying, how can I be General Burt? Not just education wise, but like your opinions, your thoughts. When a young person comes to me and, and says, how can I become someone on the Space Force? How can I become a guardian? Um, they're going to be looking to you, and because you know, what what would you tell them? As uh, completely unironically, you are indeed the very model of a modern major general. <laughs> oh Good my one. God! Oh. Boy, that, that was a long walk around the block to get to that. <laughs> so to, to land on <laughs> to land Gilbert and Sullivan. Gilbert Sullivan. Okay. Worth the payload, right? Yeah. <laughs> worth the effort, right? Yeah, no, okay. it was good. It was worth it. It was good. good. It was, was good. good. It was but good. the question yeah. is serious, actually. Serious. No, I yeah. agree. And that, and that was a long way to, but that is awesome. I like that. Um, no, what I would say is, again, to join uh, the Space Force, we see ourselves as a digital service. So I'm looking for young folks who have innovative minds who want to ask why. I, I love three year olds. Ask why. Why do we do things the way we do? It's a new service. We have a clean slate. Uh, we can do anything we want in any way we want. We value artificial intelligence, machine and machine communication, obviously the whole exploration of space and where this is gonna go. And if I were to meet a young 21 year old graduating college or a young 18 year old entering college, I would say, hey, the, the sky is not the limit, it's endless. Uh, and, and there's opportunity that in their generation, they will be operating and living in space uh, in their lifetime. And, and how do we uh, go to that new frontier. So I, I think it's very exciting. Uh, I think we're looking for educated folks with STEM degrees. Uh, we, again, obviously what we do is very difficult and complex. So we're looking for that academic uh, rigor and background uh, to get out there and get after it. But innovation and, and asking why are the two key things. And I think this generation is stock full of it uh, and ready to come hard in the, the Space Force. And we have not had a recruiting problem. It's been, uh, uh, we're very small and lean, uh, purposely focused on mission. But we have not, we've seen, again, beating the doors down in every aspect uh, to join the Space Force, whether that be as officers or as enlisted members. Uh, I need you to confirm, are the, are the new recruits actually called space cadets? <laughs> Just to no. be clear. Guardians. <laughs> guardians. Oh, oh. Guardians. Sweet. Guardians. Oh, man. Mm. Now I want to join. Mm. So I, now it could be Star-Lord nice. <laughs> uh, let me ask Chuck. Absolutely. Chuck, do you, I mean, let me ask you, Charles, do you think the first person to walk on Mars is alive now in yes. like elementary school or absolutely yeah okay maybe not in elementary school maybe maybe even in college I agree yeah. whoa okay. wow that's Very pretty cool. pretty cool all right we gotta take a quick break we're gonna lose Charles Doctor Charles Liu oh uh, no. thanks Char I know yeah but we got more coming in Don't Chuck worry. I got okay we're not gonna leave you hanging here call me okay. anytime I'll be around. <laughs> Charles, you will are, have been, are, and for, will ever always be our geek in chief. Yes. Live long uh, and prosper. We'll be right back with the general and Lord Nice when Star Talk <laughs> returns.
We're back. Star Talk. We're talking about the Space Force. What is it? What's going on? What are they up to? What are their priorities? And how is it protecting all that we care and love about our modern lives? Got my co-host Chuck Nice. Chuck. Hey, hey, hey. Great to be and, here. And my special guest is U.S. Space Force Major General Deanna Burt. Yeah. Uh, General Burt, uh, welcome. This is your second segment with us, and thanks for hanging on uh, and, and giving us this much time. Uh, we're also going to bring in, in a couple of minutes, uh, someone who is now, I get to call him a veteran of Star Talk. Yeah. Uh, we have Professor Moriba Ja. He's an associate professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics at UT Austin. And I would think in terms of what he specializes in, we get to call him an astrodynamicist and space environmentalist. Sounds like we're going to need some more of those going forward. <laughs> okay. If environmentalism movement moves from the surface of the Earth to space itself. But we'll get to uh, his expertise in a minute. Uh, I just want to uh, work our way into that and, and ask, uh, General, when we think of space warfare, we're not always thinking of sort of... Uh, machines that would like turn off the switch of a of a satellite or redirect it. We're thinking of weapons that destroy. Mm. And you mentioned in the second segment, uh, was it 2007, the Chinese sort of uh, did a kinetic kill on one of their own satellites? I think we did shortly after that as well. So what is that? What does that mean for the present and future of the space environment? Well, I think it's, again, as I said earlier, no one wants a war that extends into space because those types of weapons, particularly anti-satellite weapons that we talked about, create huge debris fields that affect everyone. Uh, and so, again, not not good. So what we have to prevent against is how do we work in a multi-domain, so thinking all of our other service partners, how would we keep that uh, anti-satellite munition from launching left of launch? I don't want that to launch. and We don't want to see that debris. So how would we work uh, with all the other services in a joint fight to make sure that that didn't launch and use other capabilities. So a fight that could extend into space doesn't necessarily mean it has a space answer. It could have a land or a cyber or a special ops or another element that helps us take away that threat, particularly ground-based threats. And so mm -hmm. while that satellite, while that anti-satellite weapon is en route, a big part of that is through Earth's atmosphere. So you might expect the Air Force to have something to say about that and have want to jump in and, and help protect you on the bottom end. Uh, could be. Uh, I, I think the other piece is how do we also make ourselves resilient on orbit? How do I make myself a hard target? How do I get those indications and warning that if in fact it does launch, how do I uh, confuse the seeker or the end game to hit me so that there's a miss? Yeah, so you want to duck, is what you're saying. <laughs> you want to duck yeah. and cover. We've, we've heard that one before, that many decades ago. Uh, one more question before we, we bring in uh, our astrodynamicist. Is the, uh, the, when we took out our own satellite, if I remember, if memory serves, it was relatively lower in orbit so that most, if not all, of the debris that we created has already fallen out of orbit, whereas the Chinese satellite was much higher up with as much less air resistance to drag it down and burn up. It, am, I, am, I, am I remembering this correctly? No, absolutely. Uh, as you will recall, the, the satellite that we shot down was a large dead satellite that was re-entering, uh, and it was such a size and the amount of fuel that was on it, we were worried about it re-entering intact and hurting the population. So uh, again, hit it at a much lower orbit, as you said, such that the debris and gravity uh, would work again, work for us and bring it all in or burn it up uh, in smaller pieces. So that's exactly what we did. The Chinese, again, did that more to higher orbit uh, in low Earth orbit, and it then pushed debris up into other regimes as well as into low Earth orbit. And as I said earlier, we're still tracking debris from that and will be for decades to come. See, now what, what you just explained there, I believe is called American exceptionalism. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank even when you we, very much. Even when we Thank blow you. stuff up, we're cleaner right. about it. That's even what you just said. It's also, it's also called thinking ahead. So I don't, I just don't even understand how the Chinese could do something like that. But so, so let's bring in Professor Jot. Just so you know, Professor, um, uh, the good general here has 
has uh, bestowed a new title on our comedian. So uh, Chuck Nice is now Lord Nice, and she refers to him as the Lordship. We will, we will require that of you for this remaining segment, just so you know. Abso- absolutely. I'm, I'm here to serve the okay. Lord. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Ja, how many satellites are in orbit, approximately? Yeah, dead about, and living. Okay, well, so, so, so if we talk about dead and living, look, we're, we're talking upwards of like, you know, Six, six to ten thousand of these things de- de- dead and living, uh, but the living is four thousand. But if we include the dead stuff, then you know ten thousand or so. Um, total stuff is like thirty thousand things, but most of the thirty thousand things aren't complete satellites; they're fragments and that sort no. of stuff. So wait, are you telling me we're tracking? And this is for both of you, Major General and Doctor uh, Ja. Are we tracking? And how far down can we track in terms of size these, some of this has to be debris, some of it has, as you say, uh, uh, the dead things. What can we track? Yeah, so look, I mean, the, so the largest thing clearly is the space station, right? So we don't have an issue with that. Um, but when we go on the smaller stuff, but just really? to be clear, the space station is the size of a football field. So, yes. <laughs> so, 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 goodness, goodness to sake, we can we can track that. But um, <laughs> that's yeah, good yeah, to yeah. hear. Yeah, right. If, good. if we can't do say. that, we're we're in big trouble. We're in big yeah. trouble. I, I think I could track that with a pair of binoculars. <laughs> well, you know, I could exactly. So, <laughs> with a pair of binoculars so, from my roof. <laughs> so, so, so this is what I'm calling. It's not even low hanging fruit, Chuck. This is like fruit on the ground turning rancid. Right? Is your ability to <laughs> okay. like, yeah. But uh, yeah, the smaller stuff really we're talking about softball size oh, is, re- is, is, really, is really kind of the smaller stuff. And um, people clearly want to be able to get to like, uh, you know, golf ball size things, but that's oh, really God. hard to do. So I would say softball size is kind of on the smaller range of things. But so I'll ask you, wait, wait, I'm sorry, Neil, because now I'm scared to death from what you just said. Softball size things traveling at 17,000 miles an hour. That's crazy. So... Uh, wait, 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 Charles, anything traveling, Chuck, <laughs> Chuck anything traveling in 70,000, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get hit yeah. by a softball or a golf or, ball. Yeah, that's true, exactly. <laughs> I got a feeling you won't be taking a base. <laughs> but, but, but here's, here's, here's what scares me. What do you do when you track it and you find out that it might become injurious to something else? How did, what, then what? Okay, well, this is going to hit whatever. Now what? For the things we track, uh, again, as he mentioned, softball size and lower. The only thing I would say is, again, I said earlier, 32,000 objects is what we're tracking today, roughly, and a 5,000 active. So when we talk about active versus inactive, so if it's two inactive objects, uh, hey, we're watching crash up derby occur. There's not much to do. Uh, we just have to watch the two objects, what we call conjunct or hit each other. And we predict that and we watch that closely because then that creates more debris, right, when they hit. Uh, if it's a live object and a dead object, obviously we're contacting the owner operator of the live object and giving them that information and asking uh, them for consideration for move to protect their payload. This is called safety of flight operations that we do here every day at the Combined Space Operations Center. Uh, well, you have to, wait, have to tell country, people, you got to tell people, uh, if I understand correctly, almost all satellites retain a little bit of reserve fuel to adjust their position, either to give themselves a, a, a new boost because the atmosphere is dragging on them, or to avoid a collision. Is that correct? Absolutely. So everyone has a certain amount of gas and what they can maneuver or not. And again, when we talk to those owner operators of those active satellites, what kind of gas budget do they have and can they move? Uh, if it's two live objects, again, we make the op- make the notification to both owner operators, and then the discussion uh, is between the two of how they're going to move. Uh, we do this with both the Chinese, the Russians, commercial, our coalition partners. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are. That mission is done every day from the Combined Space Operations Center here at Vandenberg Space Force Base. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, Professor Ja, we all saw the movie Gravity. Okay, and that was a documentary. I'm told. <laughs> Just... Well, you know, anytime Sandra Bullock uh, you know, and, and and Clooney are in that, for sure, it's got to be educational. It's got educational. <laughs> so, uh, my favorite is that he comes up to the spaceship and is knocking on the outside door. But yeah, she was yeah. imagining it. But that was just a funny little scene. That's right. Uh, so, uh, in that, they do, however, portray a very real effect. And I'm told it's called the Kessler effect. Could you just briefly tell us what that is? Yeah. So 
look, there's, there's this gentleman, Don Kessler, worked for NASA for a long time, uh, came up with this hypothesis that um, given, given the, the increase in crowding of things on orbit and things going bump in, in, in the night, that there, there would be a, a tipping point, as, as it were, where even if you didn't launch anything else, the population is self-growing because things keep on colliding and you can't prevent those collisions from happening. So that's, I think, loosely what people understand as this Kessler effect or, or Kessler syndrome. So that would mean that there's a catastrophic point where it's just a roller derby up there and everything, or, or a space derby, everything is colliding, making more and more debris, colliding even more, and then all space assets gets completely wiped out. Is a never-ending chain reaction. Right, right. Isn't that kind of a chain reaction thing? Well, so, so this is where uh, people that fully embrace the Kessler syndrome would say, yes, it's this chain reaction, never-ending. Um, I'm not a big believer in never-ending things. Uh, so so I, I would say that equilibrium at some point would be reached. But equilibrium can also mean orbits become unusable. So, so the end effect is an orbit becoming unusable, and clearly we don't want to see that happen. Hmm. So, uh, but I think I think that's only unusable. So I guess I'm not a, a fatalist in that it's all going to be terrible. Yes, we care about this as the military, but I think one, it's being an owner operator, and as you said, sir, having the gas to be able to control your satellite and do orbit and station keeping properly, and when notified, being a a good operator of your capability. Second is when you get to what we would call uh, your min fuel to deorbit or move to an unusable orbit you're able to do that. And that's, you know, what we would say is that norms of behavior of how you should operate day to day. So it's free and fair for all. Lastly, I would say we were just at Space Symposium last week and a lot of discussion about debris removal. So I think this Kessler discussion also posits that you wouldn't have any debris or trash truck capability to go pick up debris. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's absolutely uh, a business case for industry and commercial. Because again, I go back to if the military were to do that, let's say I have a, an arm that goes and picks up trash or does things, it could be dual use. So you don't want that to come from a military perspective. You want that to come from industry and commercial uh, to be the trash trucks uh, or the pickup and to be fully transparent. And they would be asked to service and go pick up things or put more gas on something that's that's capable of continuing mission uh, but has run out of a, of something that's uh, like a propellant that it needs more gas. So I think there's options here to not be so fatalistic. We just haven't produced the technologies uh, yet to get there. So what about other things that could slam into satellites or even into Earth, like asteroid threats? Oh, the, the, wow. the Hubble telescope itself has a safe mode where the lid closes and it turns uh, uh, its underbelly, its sensitive underbelly towards Earth during meteor showers of high expectation so that the micro meteoroids that come through and light up the sky um, would have a minimum lasting, quote, impact on the telescope if it hit. So uh, in your portfolio of things to worry about beyond Russia, China, and possibly other, uh, uh, other adversaries, uh, is there, do you have natural uh, disasters on your list? Oh, absolutely. Every day in the environment, as you know, Dr. Tyson, is it's, the environment is very harsh uh, from solar flares, various uh, emissions from the sun uh, that impact the satellites, as you mentioned, asteroids, those kinds of things. We work closely with NASA uh, to be able to predict and talk to those media show meteor showers. Is, again, that's more in their wheelhouse of tracking and how they do deep space work. Uh, but that is shared with us. Uh, and again, we work to how do we protect our payloads, just as you talked about flipping the Hubble we, we would be looking at those same kind of options to limit any damage to our capabilities as well. Is there any kind of regulatory global commission that tells what countries what they can and cannot do? I remember China, they deorbited a satellite or something. I don't know what it was, but they were like, oh yeah, by the way, we don't know where it's gonna come down. Oh, I remember that. Remember right. that? Right. I mean, right. and, 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 yeah. I mean, like who, who? Yeah, so he's kind of watching. No, no, no. It wasn't here. just that. It wasn't just that, Chuck. They launched the 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 the, the booster, and uh, and and yes. Professor Jock, correct me if I'm wrong. They had a booster that did did not contain the capacity to control its descent back to Earth, and which leaves it kind of random. Uh, yeah, uh, Professor, right. did I get that right? Yeah, yeah. That that that's exactly right. And so so look, I mean, we have international law codified in things like outer space treaty and conventions with the UN and all that other stuff, but. 
you know, the language is widely interpreted and the implementation is like, you know, ra ra randomly assessed at best. And, and isn't that from 1968 or something? Yeah, that, 60, that yeah, 19, yeah oh, 1967, wow. right. Mm -hmm. Wow. I know. The only, so. the only other argument I would offer that other regulatory organizations that are involved, obviously you have the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. So again, when we start talking about satellite communications, whether they be in low Earth orbit uh, or geosynchronous orbit, the deconfliction of frequencies so people aren't stepping on each other uh, or, you know, interfering with each other uh, intentionally uh, as we work the design. The other one is the International Telecommunications Union, and that's who decides the has the slots out at GEO. So every one degree out in the geosynchronous belt uh, are, are slots that people can uh, go out and register for and co-locate together. So there are multiple satellites that fly in that one degree box and basically station keep and operate day in and day out together. So it can be done. Uh, I think some of the concerns moving forward is the proliferation of, of uh, low earth orbit, uh, like we talked about Starlink and OneWeb uh, and on the order of, uh, I think Starlink, I heard yesterday their new uh, satellite uh, registry that they're trying to do with the FCC is 25,000 satellites in low earth orbit. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a lot. That's, that, that, that's pretty mm -hmm. crazy, you know. But, so but so I, how I, do you regulate how they operate yeah, in yeah. that in that domain? And again, that station keeping. And so we don't get this Kessler effect we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, mm -hmm. how do how do you regulate that? This is some of the part I talked about earlier, Dr. Tyson, about why the Department of Commerce and being the owner of space traffic management and getting them on board will be important. Uh, the Department of Defense has played that role and, and will continue to do so uh, and partner with the Department of Commerce as they stand up. But you can see the value that we need. It. There's a regulatory requirement and even international regulatory element, kind of like the FAA is for air. Yeah, uh, you We need, need those. that you same need thing those. for space. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. but the, 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 I think getting to, to the Lordship's point, uh, there, is no, <laughs> there, there is no global you know, Star Trek Federation that's going to do this. It's all up to individual countries. So the countries actually have to get together and say, we are the bottleneck to all this stuff. And we, 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 we are the ones that are responsible for providing authorization and continuing supervision of all these folks. Let's agree to a set of standards, norms of behavior that we can then hold our people you know, accountable to. And I think on the one point that the general made really quick on the dual use type stuff, look, when you go with commercial people that have the grappling arms, that's also dual use technology. So I think the, the main thing is, when I was a security policeman guarding nukes at Malmstrom, I was taught a threat required intent, opportunity, and capability. Mm. So, so the thing that really separates hazard from threat is the intent piece. So what kind of behaviors can we put in place to basically put away this threat stuff so we don't assume that everything is out to get us necessarily because the capability and the opportunity for harm are always gonna be present with dual use technologies. So Dr. Ja brings up a great point. It's, it's understanding space domain awareness, not just space traffic management. Space domain awareness is more ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance in space. What is your pattern of life? How do you normally operate? Is this unusual for you? Is this your norm? Uh, how do you typically uh, station keep? All of those things play into that space domain awareness uh, over the domain for all the players that are there. And when something is or doesn't seem as it should be, then that's when this discussion of norms of behavior, having defined what is good, now if we see something that is bad, how are we going to respond? And did it rise to the occasion of that it needs a military, diplomatic, or any of the instruments of power that the nation can bring to bear? Very that's really cool. Very yeah. important facts there, that yeah. uh, just the existence of what could, could be a threat, if there's no intent, we have to, that is a conversation, that's an analysis. And that's where I don't trust AI. I think people have to be in that equation. AI is stupid. I mean, AI is about as smart as an earthworm, man. <laughs> so, SI, stupid intelligence. Yeah. Uh, we gotta, that's a whole other show, by the way. We're going to have to call it quits there. We ran wow. over. Fascinating. Uh, Professor Jaw, great to have you on again. Thank and, you. And, 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 and General Burt, a delight to meet you for the first time. And I hope this is not the, the last time we see you. Uh, yeah. We will we'll have continuing questions about this domain and what it means to Earth, to, um, to Americans, to, and, and to the future of space exploration. And now, now, can I tell people that I know a two-star general now? Is that okay with you? Absolutely. And that of 50 cents will get you a couple dollars. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Chuck, you just got to earn this. She was describing uh, one degree boxes out there on... On, on in the on, on uh, geo. So, how many boxes are there? Um, 
Well, it's round, so it's got to be 360. Right? Very good. You get it. Okay. Just check it. <laughs> I, knew, I, I knew he was leading you in that direction. Chuck, you got one. He, Let you, you, earn your, he, you earn your lordship today. Yes, he earned Star-Lord right there. Star-Lord. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. That's it. We really got to end it right there. Uh, thank you all for making this work and making it informative and even fun. Neil deGrasse Tyson here for Star Talk. As always, keep looking up. <laughs>